Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you guys for showing up. Um, we want to keep the kind of theoretical part sh short and leave up most of the time for Ben to show you how to actually build a solver from scratch. But maybe just in case not everyone is um, super familiar with what we're doing at Car Protocol, I just have like a very few slides to introduce what a solver actually is. So maybe first of all, what is Cow Protocol? Um, Cow Protocol is an well exchange that allows you to swap tokens, just like you would know from uh, Uniswap or other DEX aggregators. And it's uh, most famously known by its front end called cowswap.exchange. Um, it has a certain, you know, a number of features that your normal DEX or DEX aggregator doesn't have. Uh, first of all, it um, basically adds a very thin batching layer on top of existing uh, Ethereum AMMs. So instead of you as a user executing your own trade yourself as a native Ethereum transaction, you're just signing an off-chain message and hand that off-chain message to a you know, third party, which we will talk about more in detail today. These are the so-called solvers. Um, but these solvers can batch multiple trades into a single Ethereum transaction. And by doing so, we can achieve structurally better prices because we don't have to route every single trade against an AMM or against an active market maker. We can actually match trades peer to peer. If I'm selling ETH and somebody else is buying ETH, we don't have to go to Uniswap, don't have to pay for the gas fees, don't have to pay the liquidity provider. We can match ourselves peer to peer, what's called a coincidence of wants. We both wanting to trade the opposite asset at the at the same time, and that is a yeah a cow coincident of once where the name cow protocol comes from. On top of these kind of structurally better prices that come from batching, um, cow protocol also serves as, as a meta dex aggregator, um, which we will see uh, maybe on yeah one of the slides we'll see that right now uh, we have the main dex aggregators be implemented as one of our solvers. So no matter which DEX aggregator would give the best price for your order at a time, um, we make sure that that DEX aggregator is taken into account when, when the batch is settled on chain. Um, it also provides MEV protection uh, from your trades by virtue of having this off-chain competition uh, of different solvers for your surplus. So where on in traditional exchanges, if you have a big slippage tolerance, you'll likely find some searcher which takes your trade and will likely go, is likely going to sandwich it by moving the price exactly at your slippage tolerance, then including your trade and uh, moving it back forward. This is not possible in Cow Protocol because a solver that would suggest such a settlement uh, would not win the competition because basically they don't give you any surplus. They, if they match you exactly at the limit price, they're not providing any value for you and the solver that ends up winning the batch is the one providing the most value. On top of that, solvers, um, at least today, use uh, flashbots or other kind of MEV private mempool protocols to be um, yeah, not subject to MEV. And then last but not least, from a user perspective, the swaps are gasless in that you don't have to pay any ETH for your trades. Uh, actually, we'll just take the protocol just takes a, a certain amount of your sell token uh, in exchange for then refunding the solvers the transaction costs that they accrued for settling the, the trades. Um, and so from a user perspective, you don't need ETH for your trades. And also, you, don't, you never have failed transactions um, because your orders are just off-chain. And if they uh, expire or get out of the money, then, well, you didn't make the trade, but you also don't have any failed transaction costs. So that's pretty nice. Um, maybe just from an architecture perspective, I kind of alluded at, at it uh, already on the first slide. The difference between Cow and a traditional DEX is that Traditional DEXs, users submit their trades as a raw Ethereum transaction directly on chain and giving it to the miner. They're basically putting the faith of their trade being executed honestly into the hands of the miner. And as we know from MEV, that is most likely not the case. In Cow Protocol, what we do instead is we sign an off-chain message that we hand over to um, the Cow Protocol order book where it will be aggregated by a solver and then there will be one Ethereum transaction, which settles all the orders that are in the current batch. Um, the solver can use uh, Flashbots, for example, and, and you know just is a professional entity that can better protect uh, the trades that are inside the batch from MEV than you know the, the average MetaMask user would. And maybe just more importantly also, if we have a cow, so in this example, uh, one user is buying ETH, one user is selling ETH, 
we don't even have to go to an AMM, and whenever we reduce the amount of volume we settle against the AMM, we also reduce the amount that is subject to MEV or prone to MEV because, well, if you trade peer-to-peer, -peer, there's the ordering doesn't make a difference, and so there's no MEV in those batches. And just as a kind of small addition, it's not just one solver that is uh, settling these batches, it's actually a network of solvers that compete for the best execution. And that's why we are here today. We want you guys to build your own solver and become part of that competition. And whoever solver wins the kind of competition for order flow is being rewarded at the moment with 100 cow tokens per batch. And that um, is like a you know, really nice incentive and a really nice revenue stream to, to participate in, in that competition. Um, so these are just the kind of solvers that are out there today. I was actually hoping to skip those. Um, but yeah, as you can see, we have a bunch of, that's why we consider ourselves a also MetaDEX protocol. We have a bunch of solvers that just take each order and settle it against one inch, you know, try to see what, how would one inch solve it, how would zero X solve it, how would Paraswap solve it. Um, and basically that is, you know, it, it acts a bit like a baseline. If there's no cows, if there's no value that we can add from peer to peer batching, then we just, you know, match with whatever is the best aggregator out there. We then have a slightly more, um, advanced solver that, that actually looks at uh, how different DEX aggregator would solve each individual order, but then still tries to find coincidence of wants based on these hops. So if one user is trading USDC for ETH for GNO, and somebody is trading balancer for ETH for USDC, then that solver would still find the coincidence of want on the uh, USDC ETH hop. So basically decomposing the, what the DEX aggregators give us into different hops and trying to find um, cows on these hops. And then we have two somewhat more involved mathematical formulations of the uh, overall objective or uh, optimization problem, one in a mixed integer uh, linear programming form and one in a quasi-linear programming form. Uh, the details of those are a little bit more involved. We have a um, more technical talk on YouTube that you can watch on the more inner workings of these two solvers. But maybe just as like, you know, an idea of what is out there in the solver landscape today. Also as like a little bit of, you know, what, what could be a inspiration for you as, as to, you know, what, what additions or what, you know, what your solver might want to implement. And just on the right side, you can see the distribution, at least that was the distribution a couple of weeks ago, where you can really see that um, uh, even, you know, even solvers that where you would assume they might not do, you know, they're like inferior to, you know, some other solvers are still making a good amount of, um, are still winning a good amount of batches. So here we can see, of course, um, there's, you know, some solvers that are dominating. I think at the moment, these are the, um, the DEX aggregator solvers, because a lot of batches still just come with one order. But then even some of the more naive implementations still win about 5 to 10% of the batches. So there's, that, that's still very profitable. And so, yeah, what I'm trying to say is it's still very early days. There's, the competition is probably not as strong as it hopefully will be in a, in a few months or in a year. So if you join now, there's still um, a lot of money that can be made. Uh, why should you run a solver? Kind of the first thing globally for the protocol is that by virtue of having a solver competition, we make sure that users are actually getting as much surplus out of each batch as possible. So at the bottom line, we provide better prices to the users, which should increase the amount of users that come to the protocol. And so overall, it will be a win-win uh, for the protocol, but also for the, the solvers. We have this uh, quite nice reward. Um, here it says will be rewarded with cow, but that's already happening. So we, we pay out every Tuesday, so it should happen today actually, 100 cow token for each batch that a solver won, which is a really nice uh, income stream. And then the third reason why we also want to have this kind of distributed and permissionless and decentralized solver infrastructure is to make the protocol more robust against failure. Um, so if, you know, right now we can see 0x and 1inch are really performing super well, but what if the 1inch API goes down for whatever reason, then we still want to have a diverse um, set of solvers running in the background to make sure that the, the protocol is robust and, and truly kind of yeah, permissionless and unstoppable. Um, so now these are the old slides, right? So uh, I think these ones I'm not gonna talk about because Ben will go in more detail uh, into those. So let's just look at the high level architecture. I think that's interesting. So we have, um, we have users that are placing orders from their MetaMask account or from their, their bots into 
uh, what we call an order book. Um, so basically just a, a database where we collect all the orders that are part of a batch. And then we have another central component at the moment, which we call the driver, that periodically initiates the batch auction and basically asks the order book, give me all the orders that are currently um, in the batch that I'm now supposed to clear, now supposed to solve. And then the driver sends an HTTP request to all the solvers that are registered with it, um, passing the instance.json, so passing all the orders that are in the current batch as a argument um, in this web request and expecting a response that is also in the JSON format, kind of giving it the recipe of how the current batch should be matched. So which orders are touched, what AMMs are used, and, and some other information that Ben will, will talk in, in much more detail about. And then the driver will take all the different solutions, it will rank them internally based on the objective criterion we have defined, basically seeing what, what solution gives in aggregate the most price improvements to our, to our users, the best increment, well, the best surplus, um, the difference between limit price and, and the price that we execute them, and chooses the best one to then settle it on Ethereum. So right now, the settlement is still managed by the centralized driver component, um, and all that solvers have to do is basically provide an endpoint that takes an instance of JSON and returns a result of JSON. Um, this slide, okay. So yeah, this is how you become a solver today. Just focus on kind of this interaction uh, on the top right. Um, this is the format. And then yeah, just in the future, we want to get rid of the centralized driver component and basically just have um, just have this, the order book uh, kind of as, a, as the protocol owned you know, liquidity source and even that we would like to decentralize at some point maybe with um, some data availability chain that just says as of this batch here are all the orders that are part of it but for the foreseeable future this component will likely be maintained by, um, by Cow protocol and will be centralized but we would at least like to make sure that um, solvers can themselves initiate, basically know every 30 seconds or every 15 seconds there's a new auction. That means I have to ask the order book for the current batch. I will compute a solution, I will announce that solution, and there will be a communication channel between different solvers, likely through WebSockets or some other communication protocol, so that each solver knows at the end of the you know, solution window if it has computed the best um, settlement, and if that's the case, the solver can itself take care of settling it on chain so that solvers can do smart things like um, incorporating the Eden network or flashbots or you know, do other optimizations that are also affecting the settlement. Uh, that's the last slide? Okay, cool. So then I will hand it off to Ben and uh, Ben will talk you through an actual workshop and actually you know, starting uh, from code and first principles on how you can build a solver in Python. All right, hello. So, Felix gave us all a really good introduction on what we're doing. And today, um, so at first glance, it may appear that building a solver, where do you start? What do you do? So, what I've done for all of you today uh, is I've hollowed out an existing Python solver. So, if you looked at the diagram that you saw, saw there before, um, essentially, you just need to run a server that will accept this instance file and return a result that is the solution to a batch. And so what we now have, uh, what we'll have and what we'll work with today, we can set this up right here, is, is sort of um, an existing server that's already parsing these instance files. You have the objects at hand, the orders from the order book. You'll also have what's given to you by the driver is, um, a collection of available on-chain liquidity. So, I mean, right now the driver supports Uniswap v2, SushiSwap v2, Balancer v2, oh, anyways, uh, basically standard Uniswap pools. Uh, I'm not really sure what the current state of all the liquidity sources we natively support are at the moment, but those ones for sure. Um, so along with the instance file, you're given all of the orders. Of course, we want to prioritize matching these trades peer to peer, but when, even when two peer-to-peer -peer trades are matched, sometimes somebody has a much smaller order and someone has a large order. And there's always this, or it's, it's very unlikely that two orders will just match directly. So there's usually this remaining amount, and this remaining amount will be settled through some AMM, 
just to sort of make sure all the trades are filled and also reduce the amount of fees that you're paying to these automated market makers. So along with the in instance, you have the orders, the AMMs. Um, and I think we'll see, actually right here is, is a pretty good example. You're also given all of the tokens that are relevant for the batch. This would be a complete list of the tokens with their, the number of decimal places uh, that are contained in the set of buy and sell tokens for all the orders that are being given to you. Um, right, and so the result, I guess we'll take a look at that here before we even get into the code. Uh, the result will look like prices. So every single order that is touched, all of the tokens that are the buy or sell token of every touched order should come with a price. Uh, this is part of the uniform clearing prices condition. So you can specify a price for each token that is being touched uh, in the orders that are being touched. And you'll say, what is the executed sell amount, executed buy amount of each order? Oh. And along with the AMMs, you'll do something similar. An AMM is essentially treated like an order. How much of it, you, how much are you going to sell to the pool, and how much are you expecting to get back from the pool? Uh, there is an additional. Oops, I should not be clicking on this. Uh, there is an additional uh, part of the result file. This is interaction data. We won't be touching this today, but for those of you um, who want to sort of improve on the framework that I've put together already, at the moment, the response uh, file does not contain this interaction data. So that's a good first issue for those who want to contribute to this project. Um, right, so interaction data would be if you have access to other sources of liquidity. Say, for example, our driver doesn't hand you a bunch of curve pools or doesn't hand you a Uniswap V3, but you are able to, you have the capability to, to do all the arithmetic necessary to compute the ex ex executed sell amount and buy amount to an additional source of liquidity like Uniswap V3. You can provide the target contract address the ETH value, uh, basically you provide the transaction data that you need to interact with that particular source of liquidity. Um, inside of our um, sort of exchange settlement contract there are three types of interactions, pre-interactions, intermediary interactions, and post-interactions. I'd say for the most part, if you're settling a, a trade via Uni V3 or some additional source of liquidity that you have access to, You'll probably be thinking about doing the intermediary ones. Um, usually the post interactions are for wrapping or unwrapping ETH to send off to the users. And I can't actually think of a good example right now for what the pre-interactions are for. However, they should probably also be specified in this return uh, data. Anyways, without further ado, for those of you who have your computers available today, I have brought in my own personal computer where I try not to do any work. I have nothing installed except for the requirements that are in the readme here. And we will set up a solver right here. And I will, oh, uh, I, I'm going to be using this whole screen. I don't think this should be full screen. Um, but I can make it much bigger <laughs> for those of you who can't see. Uh, right, so I think, oh, that's tough to read. But uh, the first place to visit if you're following along, would be github.com slash cow protocol slash, you can't really read that, can you? Uh, solver template py. Yeah, the internet is here. You can use the Canary Club pool bar. And am I allowed to say the password really loud? It's poolbar123. Definitely encourage you to follow along if you have a computer today with you. Uh, the minimum requirements, you don't even need to really know how to code. Uh, you definitely need to have some Python 3 version, at least 3.9, but you can try it with something lower if you want. Um, and then, uh, so Rust 1.60 or Docker will suffice. How many of you are interested in building a solver? 
How many of you have already started building a solver? All right. Sounds good. So what we'll do today is we'll get this server up and running. We'll, we'll see that we can receive these things, and we'll say, we'll, we'll print something that says, we've received an order book with however many orders. And then we will proceed in implementing the empty solve method that we have here today uh, with a very naive implementation. And uh, I can also discuss a little bit uh, of some strategy on how you might want to go about building uh, something very straightforward that is more meaningful than my naive solver that we'll do today. And, and then for those of you who are into um, combinatorial optimization, uh, there's lots of stuff. There's a few goodies here left in this hollowed out project that you may be able to oh, use. So everybody ready to continue? All right, so we'll first clone this repository. I'll make this bigger for everybody too. So we'll clone our... Hmm? I'll just copy it from here. So what's really nice is that what we've got ready for you here today is the server itself and an empty solve method. So all you really need to do is implement the solve method. Okay. So if we're taking a look at the readme, we'll want to install our little Python virtual environment. Okay, let's just work from here. activate this environment and install the requirements. Is this big enough for everybody? So if you've made it this far already, then we can actually run the server right now. And if there's some interest, we can also walk around through this little code project to see what kind of goodies we have. We'll probably take a look into those while we build a very naive solver. So we've got this server running, and we would like to pass it in some sort of instance info. I've got this small example. This will be the example we work with today. Um, it's got a list of tokens, a few tokens that are involved, and there's two orders. It just so happens that these two orders overlap with each other perfectly. And I'm actually going to reduce the buy amounts and sell amounts so we, can, so we don't have to look at so many zeros, if that's okay with everyone. So what we'll do uh, at the beginning, and we should also probably look a little bit, for those of you who do really want to run a solver, there are a lot of little flags and Boolean uh, variables that determine some characteristics of the order that need to be consider considered while you're um, trying to put together your, your, sol your solutions. For example here, allow partial fill. Partially fillable orders can definitely change the, the solution you might have. We'll talk about that a little bit more soon. Okay, 
So this is the example we'll be using. And what you can do, since the server is now running somewhere in this terminal, uh, wherever that may be, yeah, it's running over here. We can copy this post. And we will, what we're doing is we're, we're calling this endpoint that's running now, and we're calling the solve. Uh, we're requesting to solve, and we're giving it this example. So from within the project directory, you can make this post. And what we have happening right now, essentially, is we received a batch auction with a name that was not provided. And some of the parameters that were supplied along with this request, the auction ID, the instance name, which was not provided at the time, a time limit. Uh, right now, I believe the time limit that's set is 15 seconds, although it will probably be lowered to 10. So just be aware, something you'll need to set up inside of this framework if you choose to use this is some sort of an uh, alert system or an alarm clock that will sort of terminate your solution process and return a trivial solution if you haven't found something before the time limit is up. So another exercise for those of you who would like to actively work on something today, set up an alarm clock. Um, right. The maximum number of executed orders. Use internal buffers. So this is being passed along to the solver, uh, though it's sort of the driver that determines uh, whether or not the internal buffers are being used. I think for now, it's probably safe for us to assume that we won't be using internal buffers, but um, sort of a feature for gas cost optimization of settling batches is that, as we've discussed, or as you've heard earlier, the fees are collected from the sell token of the orders, and these fees are collected inside the settlement contract itself. So over time, the settlement contract accrues a balance in arbitrary tokens that are being sold on the platform. And now having this balance in there um, to, to efficiently perform a swap for smaller trades, say, if the settlement contract has the balance to just fill your trade for you, then rather than go to an AMM like Uniswap, you can just um, fill the trade directly using the internal balances of the settlement contract. So gas-wise, for like cost of execution, this amounts to the transfer of the sell token into the settlement contract from the, the, the trader, and then the transfer out of the balance that's already in there of the buy token back to the trader. So you're filling a trade at the cost of two ERC-20 transfers, along with some validation inside the settlement method. Um, right, uh, use external prices. So I believe prices are prices being provided. Uh, let's not talk about that right now. We'll get to it later if, if we need to. The native token is usually the wrapped version of the native currency of the network. So generally speaking, when you're computing any sort of objective criteria, we talked about this, or it was mentioned a bit earlier, you have the surplus of the trade, which we're sort of trying to maximize, trying to maximize the user's surplus. There's also um, the fees that are taken into consideration, although they may not permanently be part of the objective criteria and the cost of execution. So I, should, I think as a solver, when you're optimizing for a batch, you should think, get the users the best prices, as in get them uh, as much surplus as you can and reduce the cost of execution for this, this batch. Um, and so generally speaking, we, we evaluate this objective function in the native token of the network. In this case, this is the address of wrapped xdi. Okay, so what we've seen so far, or what's happening right now, we actually sent a request and we received some arbitrary response. That's because the server that we're running has this little, um, the handler for the solve route in our little thingy here. There's two, there's really only two endpoints. Actually, there's, there's three, and we're gonna look at one of them soon. One of them is health. It just returns true. Basically, the driver will check if your server is running before it sends you something. And so if it's running, it returns true. If it's not, it doesn't return anything. Uh, and the solve method. So essentially what we're doing here, and, and with what we've provided here for a framework, 
is parsing the response JSON into the object of interest. Uh, this being a batch auction model. We can take a look at it at some point. Right now we're basically just printing that we received a request and then I have thrown together some arbitrary response with a few different fields and we're returning it. And so that's what we saw when we made this post is just being returned some arbitrary response data. So we're basically in a position to fill out the solve method and return a real solution instead of a fake one. So what we're gonna be working on today is batch.solve. But maybe just before we go there, I thought I might show you that if you do go to, what is the address here? If you do go to the local host, and you search for docs. So there's kind of another endpoint here as well. That's not great. There it is. So there is this little API, so you can see the solve route, the health route, and a schema containing a whole bunch of different goodies, some of which are more interesting than others. This is a little too dark for everyone, right? We've got the batch auction model, which is coming in as, a, as, a, um, as the request. Tokens, orders, metadata, and AMMs. Anyways, if you're, if you're keen and you've got the server running, you can take a look through some of these. I'd say that there's still a few things missing, but there's definitely enough for us to work with today. Settled batch auction model. It's got orders, prices, AMMs, but it's essentially, it's essentially the same as the request itself, except that it's got an additional field for the executed buy amount and the executed sell amount. Okay. So, without further ado, let's see what we can do about implementing batch.solve. Right now, it's empty. So there are, actually, there are a few goodies here that we should probably take a look at, and we can talk about how we might build a solver. There's this nice class here called exchange rate. It's not really directly relevant to the order book itself or the solution itself, but this essentially allows you to, to take, if, if you were to think about a traditional order book between only two different tokens, you have buy orders and sell orders for two different tokens, uh, what you can do with this exchange rate is essentially like put these orders on a line and determine where they overlap. So one reasonable strategy to a solver that doesn't require any fancy um, operations research would be to find all of the orders, find the largest set of orders between just two token pairs. Get the sell orders A for B and get the, the, get the orders A for B, get the orders B for A. Sort of put them on a line, the overlap, and determine where they are overlapping and, and match the ones that you can. Traditional order book. This is, I don't even think we have a solver that does this at the moment. So could be a thing you can do that does not require a whole lot of fancy simplex method stuff. But we won't even go that far today. What we're going to do is we're going to go take two orders that overlap with each other exactly, and we're going to match them, and we're going to return that solution. What we can do, if we do get far enough, is, is then take one of these orders and divide it in half to make it a smaller order, and we can at least think about how we'll take the remaining amount and, and fill it with some AMM. Okay. So exchange rate is kind of cool, but not directly uh, relevant. We do have uh, a couple of, of goodies that I put here in the order. Just It's mostly cheating so that it's easier for me to write a solver today. Um, and that would be determining if two orders overlap and determining how much they overlap. And so you can, and this is what we've been talking about. Can they both be fully filled with each other? Is one of them, is the right, is the, is the order on the right fully filled uh, or is the, basically determining which of the two is smaller if they do overlap? So 
Without much more hesitation, hesitation, let's take a look and see what we can do to write our own solver. So we already have access to, um, let's just say, we have the orders. The orders are just self.orders. We have a list of all the orders that have been provided to us. So that's the bonus of having this wonderful framework that parses the instance for us. So now I'm going to naively iterate over every single pair and see if the orders directly match with each other. And if they do, we'll match them. Sound good? So we've got those. Now something, something to keep in mind, buy orders and sell orders are geometrically very different. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more soon, uh, but don't, don't think it's easy. All right. So our order I and order J are going to be these things. Now, essentially we want to check if, if these two orders match with each other. So we're, we're essentially going to say if, so this little order match type thing does the check for us. It checks first, you have, you're giving it two orders and you're saying, do these orders overlap? And if they do overlap, it, to what extent do they overlap? So I can show you this example we're using today. We have a cell order. The tokens are just reverse of each other. Token A, one person is selling token A, the other person is buying token A. And the other one is buying token B, and the other one is selling token B. And, and what we have here in amounts is somebody's willing to sell 12 in exchange for 100. And on the other side here, we have someone who's willing to sell 100 in exchange for 10. So in this particular situation, both of these orders can be fully filled with each other. And in fact, this person who was willing to buy only 10 will actually wind up with 12. So they're going to even get a surplus. In this case, uh, if we were measuring the objective criteria or just the surplus in the token that is whatever the sell token of this is, then we would see the surplus is 2. Um, however, we generally measure all of this in the native token that we provide. Now, what we can do later if, if we get really confident, is divide this, this order by two, make it a six and a 50, and then we'll see that only, the, that, that only half of this, only half of the other order is fill, can be matched with this, and then we should take the remaining amount to some AMM. In any case, so if the order match type is both filled, then we're just gonna set, oh, there's a, there is a method Execute. Now, execute does a few things, like validate that what you're about to set the executed amounts for actually satisfy the limit price that the order uh, in the order itself. I won't get too much into there, but what we're going to do is we're going to call this execute. I guess you could say this is one of the goodies I left behind for you. A little bit of validation when you attempt to set the execution amounts of the order. So order I is going to buy order J dot sell amount and is going to sell order J 
dot buy amount. So I guess the, the nice thing that we have here is that all these things are sort of ready for us to work with. Of course, this framework has a long way to go. It's still incomplete in some sense, but we do already have some tools that we can work with. And similarly, we're going to fill order J with the reverse amounts of, of the other one because they are both fully fillable. This thing hovering is not really my favorite. What is that? So we found that these two orders match them with, them with each other directly, and we've set the thing. Another thing that you absolutely have to return with the, with the solution is the prices. Now this is something that I can't, ex I'll try to remember, but we have to actually set the prices of the two tokens that we're filling. Yeah, I'm gonna have to uh, check on that. It's quite subtle. Right, so in this case, we haven't done anything to evaluate the objective of our thing. The fees, well, Right, so the fees are actually part of the order itself. So the fee is always in the sell token. Uh, I guess they're sending the token along with it anyways. The fees are pre-quoted. You'll notice that I divided a much larger order uh, by 10 to the power 18 here. So this is all, all the units are in way. Everything is passed to you as a string integer. While you're working with this, um, it's going to be very difficult to stick with integers, especially if you're running some sort of like, um, optimization software. Um, you'll definitely want to pay very careful attention to how you do your rounding, and all of this definitely matters. Uh, you'll probably not stick with working with integers, unless, of course, you take this approach where I said, let's do the traditional order book, continue, just, just look at the overlaps and see if you can just match whatever collection of orders does happen to overlap. You may be able to continue working with integers there, but if you're really like solving this full thing in a multi-dimensional setting, you'll likely want to convert to some sort of precision. This framework actually does that. It uses a sort of decimal with some configurable precision we can look at, but then afterwards you need to convert back to integer. And I mean, if you're working with some sort of like um, linear optimization model, I think some of the strategies that our team has used in the past is to sort of, uh, sort of add, you take all the constraints that you're given and you like add some epsilon bound to them so that your feasible region is well contained inside uh, so that what you're optimizing on is actually strictly contained inside the feasible region that you really have. And then later on you can truncate to an integer and you're still within the realm of feasibility. Uh, for those of you who, how many of you work with integer programming in, in the past? Great, so you're all comfortable with what I'm saying, and it's not too far off. Anyways, you'll definitely want to keep in mind when working with, with your decimals that precision issues will arise. Uh, feel free to reach out to our team who's, who's had to deal with it sometime in the past. I'm sure somebody will be happy to help. Luckily today, Oh, so you're asking, what about the fees? That's a good question. I think usually we have the sell amount and the sell amount before fees. In this particular case, I am assuming that this is the sell amount that you as the solver are going to work with and you don't need to take into consideration for the fees. The reason the fees are being passed to you as a solver is because if you're finding multiple solutions, you may want to evaluate the objective function on your own side before you pass the solution back. And, sorry? That, although technically right now, the objective criteria is surplus plus fees minus cost. 
So, in fact, you may be optimizing for things with the higher fees, although I don't think that will last long. I don't think that will stay in the objective criteria. Um, so, focus on surplus and uh, simultaneously minimizing costs if, if you like that kind of thing. I mean, people usually do. Right, so what we've done here, I, uh, unfortunately, this stuff's all very strange. So. I'm just going to fetch this from my, my cheat sheet. Uh, so we're going to just not to distinguish between what token, token A and token B. It's just basically the sell token and the buy token, the two tokens that we're working with right now. And we need to set prices for these tokens um, in, in this thing. This is uh, a little bit tricky. Oh, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's only one of two things. So the token A price this being the sell token of order I, is the order J sell amount. And, and the token B price is the order I sell amount. Now, this comes directly from the formula uh, in the smart contract itself. So not to cause too much confusion inside the contract itself, if you are working with a sell order, the executed by amount is computed as the sell price provided to the contract divided by the buy price. And since we know what the executed amount is, we want this sort of thing to cancel out. And this just so happens to be the thing that cancels it out. So what we've done now is we have set the executed by amount and sell amount of these two orders that match, them, match fully and set the prices for those two tokens. So we're essentially in a state to say, hey, we found a solution and send it back to the driver. I'll save that. So the only thing we really need to do now, instead of returning this arbitrary sample output that I have provided, um, we need to send back the actual stuff. So. This is actually um, a mapping of the order ID. So when the driver receives this stuff back, each order has been given some sort of an ID so that it can match the executed amounts with the orders that it gave you in the first place. So if, so we could do, we're essentially just sending back the orders converted back to a dictionary. And we've also provided this sort of parsing, the serialization from the strings that we're getting into these like sort of models with decimal precision and then back again to the string dictionaries that we need to send back. Um, and you don't need to send all the orders back either. You can just send back the orders for which if order is executed. And essentially is executed just says if the executed buy amount and sell amount are not none. So we're sending that back. Uh, the prices are something that we have already set. We set earlier or uh, batch dot prices. And in this particular case, we did not use any of the AMMs that were provided. So we can send back an empty dictionary there as well. But we did what we did receive were some pools and we, there are many pools that you can work with. So you have the constant product pools, which are essentially uni v2, sushi, and any balancer pool that has equal weights. Uh, you also have some balancer pools with multi-tokens being sent to you. If you have the confidence that you can perform their arithmetic, uh, then you can work with those and send them back. Let's just see if we have one here. No. No, we don't. No, so um, with centralized exchanges, we don't have. No. Decentralized but order book cache. Decentralized but order book. You mean like DY, DX? Exactly, yeah. But they're all contained within their own contract, are they not? Like they're sort of, um, they're not really accessible on chain liquidity. So we need something that can be sort of settled via transfer inside of a transaction and it comes into the user's account. We do have zero execution. Okay. We, we do have uh, RQ system-based. Uh, 
So partially, yes. Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, he was asking if we work with order book liquidity. I was under the impression that he was referring to something like, first of all, a centralized exchange, which is definitely not the case. We definitely work with available on-chain liquidity. Then uh, we also talked a little bit about DYDX, which seems to be sort of a self-contained contract or, or, or you, you trade internally to a contract and just update your balances. That's also not really on-chain liquidity because we can't access it directly. Uh, but uh, as Felix mentioned, we, we use 0x uh, limit orders, I guess, is that what it is? Which is essentially another form of an order book that is available on-chain liquidity. Uh, as an, I guess it's essentially what we do for order collection. Signing, the, signing a message off-chain that says, I'm willing to provide this liquidity, that stuff can be used. Um, so... These kind of zero X orders, I imagine if a solver is using them, would put them into the interaction data as opposed to the AMMs. Uh, right, so in our case, we didn't touch any of the AMMs. So I will just set this to nothing. And this is enough for us to send back a solution to the solver. Right. So let's run this again. What should we do? Right. I mean, I guess that's that. And we're running. We've got this, this sample data that we were working with. And we've now got a solve method that's been implemented. What, should, what we should be getting back from this is an internal server error. <laughs> And my guess here is that it's the parsing on the response of this sample output. Settled auction model, prices, uh, right. Because the prices are in a decimal format right now and we need to return it back as a string and we haven't done that. So what I will do is Do it myself. Let's see. <laughs> and I think what we're doing, I think the issue is that um, the, the prices is probably a token object rather than a token string, like a, an EVM address. So we can either take the string of the token, the string representation of the token, and this, this here is a, probably a decimal. So we have a little helper method, decimal to string, that we should probably be finding for the values. Now this is a dictionary, so here. I mean, this is my best guess at what went wrong there. Uh, let's take a look. And if not, we'll send back empty prices. So something else that has been taken out of this that should probably be put back in is some validation before you actually send it back. I mean, this, this parser that we have for the server is essentially validating the response. Oh, look at that. Was that an intentional mistake? So I could tell you something about converting back to string. Who knows? All right, so what we have here. I mean, it's not so pretty. So let's put it into a prettier. We have access to that these days. It's 2022. All right, so we've got the reference token that we were originally given. The two orders with their executed amounts. Oh, wow. Now, I think what you'll notice is that it was, I maybe, maybe I never saved this example where I changed it to a 12. So let's not worry about that right now. Uh, the prices. Now, you'll notice also the price of the native token is there as well. And this is something you'll want to watch out for because this is definitely not quite right. Um, We've got one as the price of the native token, and then like 
10 times 10 to the 18 as something else. So you want to have your prices all relative to each other in the right way with the right number of decimal places and no AMMs. So this is being sent back to the driver. Now, what, what, what haven't we done yet? Well, we haven't actually shown how we connect to the driver and we can do all of that today. So if we go back to our originally read, original readme, now, instead of just running our server and sending it some fake info, why don't we just get this whole system up and running right now and get some real orders in our little solver? And then, does anybody have like some tiny amounts of funds on the XDI or Gnosis chain network that they might want to use today? Let's see if my naive solver can settle your trades. Okay. Um, there is something that we forgot to do. Um, something to keep in mind with your solution. We should probably, oh yeah, return immediately. We're only going to match one thing if we can. Of course, what we could do is find disjoint collections of overlapping orders, but we don't necessarily want to touch an already executed order again. So like you might want to say, and both orders are not yet executed. Anyways, I think this is fine because we're only matching one thing and returning immediately. So let us run the full nine yards. So the server is running. Our solver is on the go. Next. So we've got two options. We can, the easier option is to use Docker. So we've got a Docker image that is the solver and we're passing in an environment file that looks like this. Now, for those of you who actually become some solvers in the near future, right now some of the names aren't quite right and we'll have to get this better. The URL will be the URL to your solver. Even though it says cow dex ag solver URL, it should be HTTP solver URL, really. Um, the solver account, I don't think you need to worry so much about right th this right now. We're running this in dry run mode. None of the transactions will be uh, sent to the chain, uh, although I think that you can at least get the transaction simulated on Tenderly. So with a certain configuration that you have here, the driver will take your solutions and simulate the transactions to see you know, if they would have reverted or not at the, at the block that they're being settled. All right, so we're doing all of this on Gnosis Chain today. This is a standard uh, configuration. The order, order book URL is the, the order book URL is the actual order book URL for our uh, staging environment. And so this way we can go, there's probably not very many orders being placed there right now. And if people want to place some orders, we'll, we'll be able to do so. Anyways, it should be as easy as this, although I am expecting to run into an issue because I don't have the end file. Right, so there's a sample end file in here. And you can just copy it over. There's nothing special in there that's private, so you don't need to worry yet about that until you start adding your own private key. Uh, take note, the solver account that you saw in the end file here, you can put the public key, I don't, I, this kind of looks a little long for a public key, but you can put either the public key or the private key in here. Um, the, the public key will just use it as if it's some account that's that address, send this, the simulations that way. But if you are actually submitting settlements, you'll have to provide an, a, a private key with with, uh, with ETH that can settle the transactions. Although for, for us right now, I think the solvers themselves won't be... Oh, I, there we are. We're running, the, we're running the driver part and there are no orders in the order book. So if somebody would like to navigate to barn.cowswap.exchange, we can place a couple orders and we'll at least see, first of all, that the order book has got a few orders in it. And then on this side, what we'll probably see is my solver crash. 
But, I mean, apart from that, we might just see that the orders are coming in, being sent to us, and now we can work with them. So, where are we here? All right, what am I going to buy today? Well, I think I'm going to buy some cow if I can. Hmm. Just waiting on uh, some token balances. I guess everybody's downloading a Docker image right now. Well, I don't have much to work with here. Let me just change accounts. Okay. So, I'm going to sell some wrapped X dye for. I'm going to buy some cow. Uh, we should talk at some point about the difference between buy and sell orders for who, those who are not already comfortable. Very clearly different. So, I'm going to place an order to. Uh, Sell, sell some wrapped X dye for cow. You can see how placing an order on, on uh, cow protocol works. You're signing an off-chain message, basically with the quote that you were given in the interface. And over here, we're going to see that there's now one order in the order book. And on our server side, I suspect we should be seeing, oh, there it is. Uh, well, we're receiving this batch constantly. It's not being filled at, filled at some point. We'll probably find that the order just gets filled by the real solvers. And in the meantime, we are not really able to match a single order. So, oh, there's some orders coming in. I wonder if we'll be able to, uh, maybe I'll just do the reverse order myself. Anyways, um, so this is, although it took me a really long time to say all that, all you really need to do is clone this repo, run server.py, and uh, you're already connected to, I mean, you're already in a state to be like, at least shadow reading our order book and, and trying to solve batches. Yes. Right, yeah, so you're asking about barn or not barn, and that's really just configured here in the order book URL. So you can have access to the production order book as well. I didn't want it to be so noisy, uh, but you just specify whatever URL for the order book, and you've got instances as big as your heart desires. But I think this is a really good environment to be working on a real network with the real protocol deployed and not have an order book cluttered with orders that maybe, I don't know, if you want to provide your own, place your own orders and, and things like this, that's one place to work with. You could use production on the, and of course this is a Gnosis chain event, so we're using a Gnosis chain version today. But yeah, I mean, long story short, this tiny little readme will have you up and running with, um, with a server in minutes, and all you have to do is write the solve method. So it's literally just run server and, and then run this container that will start shipping orders into your, into your solver. Yep. I just want to ask a bunch of really stupid questions. Feel free to start. I'll repeat them if you don't mind. It'll yeah. just sound like me asking yeah. a bunch of really stupid so a, questions. A batch, a batch, how many orders does it have? Is it by time? Is it, what, is it, what is one batch? So this is a good question. I think this has changed a little bit over time. Um, I feel like right now we collect orders for 30 seconds, one minute. Do you? Which one? So we collect orders over the course of 30 seconds. Uh, we give the solvers about 10 seconds to solve them. So I guess you could say, let's say, once every minute, or I don't know, 30 and seconds. in one batch, there might be 20 or 30 or 40 different orders. There could be many. I think you'll find one of the parameters being passed in as metadata. Actually, we should go and touch on this again. 
Uh, maximum number of orders to execute is one, like there'll be a, an upper bound on how many you can fill in a batch okay. given to you. And then the solver is basically taking all the different orders or am I always taking one, one versus one, one order? The solver can do whatever they want to try and fill as many as they can. And you know, like cool things like ring trades. So you could have three orders, somebody selling A for B, B for C, C for A, and you can fill them like that. It's amazing. So what you'll specify as a solver is how much of each of these orders is executed and how much of each of these AMMs is executed. On the driver, yeah, you'll say this pool, we're, we want to sell this much to it. And so then what happens at the time the batch is being settled is that those orders which are touched, first of all, we validate this transaction, but essentially the sell tokens of all the orders that are being executed as specified by the solver will be drawn into the settlement contract. Then any sort of like interactions that are necessary to pull liquidity from elsewhere into the settlement contract. So the settlement contract will essentially acquire the balances it needs to send out the buy tokens on behalf of all the orders. And so this may mean multiple hops through uh, like Uniswap pools or whatever to get what is necessary to send out all the buy tokens. But so as a solver, you're really just specifying I want to execute this order, sell, buy amount at this much. And so this is just telling the transaction how to compose itself to do all the transfers necessary to put it all in there. And you don't necessarily even need to say like which order is being matched with which because it doesn't really make sense on the multi-dimensional level because you can go around in a ring and nobody actually directly traded with each other. Um, they're just shuffling their tokens around in a circle. Yeah, so what you're given at the time is basically any liquidity that our driver was able to find that is corresponding to relevant tokens with the orders. So you'll have a bunch of orders, and then we'll go and say, fetch as many pools as that we can find uh, related to those tokens of interest, and we'll provide for you the state of that pool at the block that we send you the batch. So it'll be exactly what are the balances of that pool. So you can determine the spot price and the slippage that that pool incur if you use it, but then it's on you to, to, to have the formulas in place to compute a, a valid transaction out of these interactions. Sure, you don't need to use the AMMs at all. And there is also this concept of private liquidity. Um, and there's also this concept we talked about earlier of using the internal balances. Now, at this moment, it's not on the solver side to determine if these internal balances are being used. But if the dissolver does uh, have the sort of option to choose whether it should be settled internally, because we also pass along the settlement contracts balances of the relevant tokens at the time as well. So what you would have to do is at least prove that there was an existing source of liquidity at the time where you could have traded what you were traded even though you were settling with internal balances. That will be expected of, of the solvers so that they don't just use the internal funds to make really bad trades. Uh, but yeah, so private liquidity can also be sent in um, as well and you can match directly with those. There's absolutely no requirement to use these AMMs. But I think for the most part, many of these orders are going to be not partially fillable, and it's really ideal to like fill them completely. Uh, partially fillable orders do exist as well. Um, anyways, I, I hope I've answered some questions. Uh, well, let's take him for a moment. Yours are too hard. The, I mean, since the EVM is sort of like deterministic, you could say at this block, there was a pool 
that would have given you exactly the price that you, you gave by using our internal liquidity. So um, somebody bought one ETH for $1,000, you would have to be able to say there was a pool that would have given you that ex same exchange rate on that block or there was some route through some pool that would have given you that exchange rate on that block. So concretely, we are, we are planning to add a, uh, um, basically in the response of JSON, you can actually say, this is the pool, this is how I would touch it, but please don't, don't actually impose that effect. So the driver knows what right. you want it to use, but then we'll leave it out because we have it. So what Felix is saying, for those at the back, um, there will be some point in time when you could just provide the, the pool that you would have used to settle that trade, but then you can explicitly say, don't use it, use the internal balances. And so then at the time that you're providing your solution, you're already saying, here's a pool that would have offered that price, but use the internal balances or something. Another question from that guy back, you'll be ne right next, you'll be next. So, a little bit more about the objective function. Well, I can tell you about the objective function, the current objective function that we're using and how it would have evaluated on this particular solution we just came up with. Um, actually, I can tell you a little more that hasn't been said. So, the orders themselves, we're looking at surplus. And, and we're also trying to minimize the cost of execution. And then there's also the fees. So right now it's surplus plus fees minus cost of execution. But don't get too comfortable with the fact that the fees are part of that right now. Uh, let's just think of surplus and cost. And then with the AMMs, those don't really have any surplus and we don't care what happens to the AMMs. We only care about the user orders. So for the, from the AMM side, the evaluation of the objective is literally just the cost of execution. So any use of an AMM is negative in the objective criteria. Only cost. Does that help a little bit? I'm guessing there's more of an exact formula. No? The exact formula is a surplus. Uh, oh, so then, I mean, the surplus of an order is you, you sort of take their limit price and then you, 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 set, you have how much more are you giving them. So if it's a sell order, you're trying to give them more of the buy token than they, than they were quoted, than they signed for. And the surplus is just how much more they got. If it's a buy order, then the surplus is in the sell token. Um, and it's, it's... Right, so you try to convert everything. The, the way that we evaluate it is converted into a reference token. Uh, and generally we use the, because the costs are all in ETH or the native t currency, the gas token. Um, so we generally compute this thing in, in that. And the prices are already there. Uh, uh, I told him I'd come back to him, so I'm going to do that first. What's the consequence of a... What would be the consequence of um, a solver failing to actually execute on a price that has been um, advertised? What would be the consequence of a solver failing to execute... Dot, dot, dot. At the do you mean at the price that was quoted to the user when they signed their trade? Like, or just completely. So they said that they would execute at a certain price. They were given the right to execute. They don't execute. So right now, the solvers are operating sort of on the side. They send their solution back to the driver. The driver is the one that actually ranks these things and does this, the transaction submission. So right now, it's not even the solver's responsibility to execute anything. Uh, we're doing that. Although the architecture will probably change in the future, um, and I don't know yet what that will look like. So is this working or not? I think, yeah. yeah. So specifically, um, the, the driver right now simulates all the uh, returned solutions and will pick the best one that is executable on chain. And so if, it doesn't, if it's not executable after the fact, then we'll just restart the, uh, the auction. 
um, in the future, it will, we, we're envisioning something that is a bit similar to how the ETH2 kind of attestations work. If you advertise something that you're later not able to get, you will, you know, it won't be a hard penalty, but it will be something like, you know, what might have been your reward as a, as a small penalty. Um, but yeah, right now you don't have to worry about it, as, as Ben correctly said. Okay, next question, please. Um, so I, I may have just missed this earlier, but I didn't see earlier there was a fee. There was a fee in the configurations. There was that you were writing out the fee for like a particular AMM, or was that like a um, was that related in some way to like the reward a solver would receive? I, I missed right. how solvers were. So reward. yeah, um, the fees are being quoted at the time the user places the order. And this is an estimation of what it will cost in gas. So this isn't really like a fee that we're just taking to like let people use. It's really an estimation of the gas cost of execution at the time they're placing their order. So we have sort of, let's say, price competition to give the quote. And this can be similar to the solvers, but it's, it's a little bit different. It's this price finding to get a quote. So you can look at the one inch API or the Uniswap API and estimating the gas cost of execution to fill your trade at that time. And that's basically where the fee is coming from at the moment. And in fact, I believe it's still subsidized by a certain percentage. So it's like, say, I'm not sure anymore what it is, maybe 90% uh, or 10% or reduced from the actual estimated gas cost to fill that trade. And so, of course, if you go to one inch and it turns out that your trade would take five hops, we do try to account for that. If it's going to go through five AMMs, we try to, you know, quote the fee explicitly for um, what the cost of execution is. And the subsidy even still makes sense because ideally, if we can do, when, as we batch these together, even as soon as you have two or three trades in a single batch, um, the actual cost of execution for that trade is greatly reduced um, going through... Uh, these kinds of batches. And then I guess just the follow up was um, solvers, I guess, are rewarded in what way relative to like, you know, how they solve a particular. Right. So the current setup for the solver rewards is that at the end of each week or accounting period, we do this on a weekly basis. The solvers are rewarded for the ETH spent on successful batches. So we don't reward, we don't reimburse the gas costs for failed transactions. We only reimburse the successful batches plus 100 cow tokens per batch settled. And, uh, but there is a bit of a, a concept of a penalty and we should probably talk about that a little bit. So we deduct from the, re the reimbursement based on this sort of negative slippage incurred by the solver over the week. So I guess the protocol itself uh, keeps positive slippage from AMMs and eats or swallows the negative slippage uh, from AMMs. And so this can be that, uh, anyways, uh, luckily though there is a, like a hard limit on the, the slippage per order. So like, um, I mean there's, there's a name for it that I forget right now, maximum slippage perhaps. Um, anyways, this hard limit sort of keeps the negative slippage like sort of bounded on one side while the positive slippage is, is sort of unbounded. Ideally, or th the idea is that over time, uh, more or less, this is all positive slippage. Uh, it balances out to be more positive than negative because of the hard lower bound. Um, but so we track this slippage incurred by solvers and sort of um, at the end, it, we, we, don't re we convert the negative slippage in our, all these tokens back to ETH and we deduct the negative slippage um, from the reimbursement. But essentially, it's reimburse the gas costs and 100 cow tokens per batch, although this may change in the future. And by the way, when you mean batch, it's like a batch of two to 10 to 100. If they give any, then it's a, there's a cow, uh, 100 cow reward. Or I mean, right now there are solvers, single order solvers, that even if there's only one order in the batch, um, that's the batch. Although, yeah, uh, I think it's going to be really hard to compete with the single order solvers that exist today. Uh, I think the real competition comes in when we're talking about um, settling batches with multiple orders. And that will be a, a time where you all come in and you can outcompete one inch. Thank you. There can only be one winner for each batch. 
each batch, one winner. Question in the back. There's a, there's a mic coming for you. Uh, does the server has to, has to fulfill all orders, or is it fine when some orders are left yep. behind? Some orders can be re remain untouched. Some orders are not solvable. So, uh, yeah, I mean, really, you're just given the batch with all the orders in it, and you do your best to fill as many as you can and get the most surplus for the users that you can. Um, and you definitely don't have to touch every order. Probably a second question. I think Felix wants to add something to that. So what Ben said is, is correct. Um, you can leave out orders. Uh, and we are working on specifying uh, certain rules that um, basically will ensure that you're not just censoring orders, right? So um, if, you know, if you're saying ETH is trading at $3,000 and somebody would be willing to buy ETH at a price of up to $5,000 and you tell that person, you know, we didn't touch your order, but here's the price of ETH, then that would be unfair. Like um, there is like this concept of envy freeness. Um, basically, if you are not matching somebody's order, then that means the price is not fulfillable. Um, so th there will be, we're working on some rules of the game that uh, specify this further, like when are you allowed to ignore an order? Um, so yeah, uh, you know, as Ben said, if you cannot, you know, you don't have to specialize on, uh, on, 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 on touching a specific token pair, for example. But what you likely cannot do is touch one order that is, you know, wanting to trade that token pair, leave out another, although that one would be happy to trade at the prices that you're trying to settle. So if, if you don't know how to settle a token pair, you can ignore it, but you cannot just say, you know, I will, I will trade half of the orders that are on that token pair, unless they violate the limit price. Well said, and thank you for reminding me. Yeah, sorry, this goes back to a question that was asked earlier, which is what happens when you have the private liquidity source and say the, that, that vanishes, so the solution is not fulfillable. Uh, you were saying you could go back and point out that at the time of the solution, you would, be, would have been able to provide that liquidity. What's the actual mechanism for doing that proof? Is it, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if this was answered in the, in the interim. It's one thing to say you could. So who's the you? Is it programmatic? How does that ha how does that work? So I mean, one thing that you can do, is since the EVM is storing the state of these pools at any given block, is go and fetch the state of the pool at that block, and um, and say here it is. I, yeah, I understand you could. <laughs> I'm wondering, is there an actual program, programmatic mechanism, automated mechanism in place, or is this basically, oh, I saw something failed, I want to challenge it, and it's a human who's getting into these transactions hmm. one by one, or is there an attestation-based version of this, or more than the, you could, there's a lot of things you could do, but what are people actually doing or proposing to do? Right, uh, I would say that we aren't quite, we don't quite have that infrastructure in place just yet, although, um, we absolutely should make this something that is uh, very straightforward and easy to do. Maybe we can go with a zero knowledge proof, but I think Felix has a little more to say about yeah, that. Yeah, so I think that the idea is that in the result.json file, you will provide the concrete you know, execution that you found on chain, but where you say, don't do it because you have internal balances, please use your internal balances instead. And you will likely not be able to use you know, completely private liquidity for this. So you might, the internal balance trade might have to be on prices of you know, protocols that, that, are, that are basically trusted. So Uniswap, SushiSwap, uh, Balancer. So you cannot just come up with some 0x order that you privately created and, and then take out afterwards. Um, and also internal balance trades are only available for a certain set of, uh, I think the fi top 50 tokens traded on, on Cow Protocol. So it's also, you cannot really create your own token and, and invent like a Uniswap pool um, on that. So, so that's kind of the, the strategy. Yeah. I see what you're getting at. Well, cool. Uh, I guess we've got a few more over here behind Felix. So I would like to ask a question about MEB. I oh, right, so, MEV. We love that stuff. So, first of all, I think like the coincidence of once, the cow solution, it's an NP problem. I think, 
or maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but I think it's a very complex problem, right? So you, Definitely. You like, what you could theoretically do as a solver is like, I put some transactions that I know the coincidence of ones, so I know the solution, and I know it's very complex, I know that other solvers won't find it. I put them, then I find this, I find this solution that I just created, like it's artificially created this, this solution to win the auction. So the thing I could win if all the other solvers are honest in the sense that they don't put their own transactions, what they could do is like put their own transactions with this unsolvable um, coincidence of ones and win every each, every each one of the auctions, right? So I guess you're referring to using private liquidity because yeah, I, mean, I mean, if they're going to craft their own cows, they would have to either do it in the form of placing orders that are available in the same batch to everyone else, or in the form of using like private liquidity of their own. They would put their own transactions. So it's like transactions that are being seen by all of the people, but they're creating these ring, trading rings that are very complex, that they know that the other solvers won't find it because it's an MP problem. And he's reverse engineering this optimization problem and finding very, very hardcore solutions that he's, he knows that he's the only um, solver that can find it. So I know this, is, this works in settlements where just, there is just one player that is strategic and the other ones are honest. Maybe like this is not an equilibrium where everyone are, are, maybe this gets very tricky when all of, all of solvers are doing that. But my question is, if there are maybe other optim like like other ways to like rank the solutions in order to mitigate um, the, this to happen. Great question. There are definitely some well-known um, concerns or uh, with with some of the some of the stuff similar to what you've mentioned already. I think Felix has got a few things to say as well. Yeah, I, I, I think, so what you're alluding to is, is definitely um, something that we need to explore and, and, and consider. Um, I, so basically the, the attack vector would be that you can extract all the surplus that is, assuming that you have the optimal solution, you can extract the surplus compared to the second best solution, right? And so I would assume that even, you know, you're right, it's a, it's a NP hard, at least NP hard problem. Um, you might not find the optimal solution in the 10 seconds that you have advertised. If somebody comes up with an artificially hard instance, you will still get to a relatively close approximation of the optimal solution, to some epsilon optimal solution. Um, and, and by virtue of having a strong solver competition and many people trying to um, solve this very hard problem at, you know, with different heuristics or with different starting points in the search space, we hope that we can you know, not always get the optimal solution, but get pretty close to the optimal solution. And then whatever is left there, yes, that's up for, um, for grabs, basically. If, if you know the optimal solution and you want to um, outpenny the second best, uh, you can probably extract the value that's in the different. That is the difference, but um, yeah, we assume that with the significant decentralization, we can actually get quite close to, to, to the optimal solution. Another question. Actually, we'll take this one here first because the mic is so close. Um, can you share your timeline for when you think you'll be adding uh, external solvers? The ideal scenario would be sometime before the end of this month. Um, I think Felix has recently posted a cow improvement proposal that um, lays out the details for what it takes to become a solver. Uh, I think you can visit forum.cow.fi to see those details. Um, I'm sure that this will evolve over time, uh, become a bit more sophisticated. The objective value, uh, the objective function that, that we've all been talking about a little bit today is still subject, undergoing some, some work and as may, may be subject to change. I don't know if it's already solidified in the current proposal or, or if that's actually permanent. I think a lot of these details are, are still sort of coming together, but we are going to open this up as soon as we can. Yeah, and particularly we're here all week and we're looking to help people that want to build a solver also hands-on kind of working together and building, uh, debugging the code, seeing what, what can be done. And um, I mean, we're ready to, to onboard new solvers, you know, after ETH Amsterdam, basically. That's kind of our, our goal. So. So really, yeah, as Ben said, end of the month is kind of, it would be great if we have an external contribution by the end of the month. 
And we've got this framework here in Python. There are other uh, existing solvers that are open source running in Rust. So if you're more comfortable there, I mean, I can't imagine somebody being more comfortable in Rust than Python, but I mean, I'm sure it exists. Both of them are wonderful. Uh, so there are definitely like existing frameworks that you can work from. This one's already hollowed out for you. Um, and just one second, to also add to what Felix says, if anyone is ready, tomorrow we have a, a workshop also for debugging a solver. So if you're interested, just hit me up and I'll, I'll send you the details after the workshop. And we also have a, a specific Telegram group. So if you also want to be added, just let me know and, and I'll add you. And now the question. Um, uh, when you have multiple solutions from multiple solvers, how do you decide which one to execute? This is the objective criteria. So they, we evaluate the surplus that these different solutions are coming from, and we just take the one with the best. Uh, it's, let's, let's call it most surplus with, with least cost of execution. Um, yeah, so that's how we choose. Uh, I wanted to just add, before we continue to the next question, one thing that Felix mentioned is really, really cool is, is having a lot of different solvers uh, with like different search, like the way they're searching for solutions completely different. We've talked about sort of running these, uh, this mixed integer program. Well, we didn't talk about it much. We've talked about this quasi-linear quasi um, thing. So, I mean, maybe to, to tell you a little bit about the two. Um, I think the mixed integer program works as it, it's, a, it's a linear model of, of the order book. I believe it doesn't include the AMMs, but I'm not really sure at the moment. While the quasi-linear one actually tries to linearly uh, approximate these Uniswap pools to treat them as if they were orders and sort of throws them all into the simplex method. So AMMs and orders. Um, but then you also have traditional order book style search space. So you have, and what I've just done here is matching some orders directly. Um, so you kind of have a lot of different approaches that you can take. Uh, and this just sort of something about how Felix said, a lot of different solvers doing a lot of different things. Um, and the next question, please. Uh, one one person behind you, sorry. Um, so the current servers are, are like general servers. They, they serve like the whole, try to serve um, many trades. But what if I have one that is like optimal for one token pair or something? Um, I, I would need to do kind of a fairly good job on all the other orders to even get my solution right. So, so is there some, some strategy maybe of merging solutions or or something like that. Uh, so there is, there is this concept, although I don't think we'll be doing this uh, going forward, where we take solutions coming from other one and we determine if they are independent, and then they can just be merged. Um, I don't know if we'll, I mean, in the essence of solver competition, we may not do that uh, going forward. However, I might say you could take one of our open source naive solvers and you could do the merging yourself. Um, Yes, and can you pass the mic? Yeah, yeah. So it actually answers my question, I think. So it means there's only, always only one uh, solution taken. So like, yeah, yeah that's okay. We rank them, we pick yeah. the best. And then you can try again next batch. And of course, there will be, in the, in the event that some orders weren't matchable in that previous batch, there'll be orders from the previous batch uh, maybe you can use to your benefit if you had already matched them and remember them for the next batch. I don't know, just an idea. Um, just before your question, I wanted to remind you there are there's also a lot of room for specialized solvers who can do what what you were refer, alluding to was sort of being very good at special token pairs. Um, for there are a lot of things out there which are ERC twenty tokens, not just DAO tokens or or whatever. I mean, there's prediction market outcomes tokens. There's there's um, these balancer or these LP tokens, liquidity provider tokens. And so there's this whole concept of like, I want to enter a balancer pool, but maybe it costs me too much gas to just um, to enter it via the contract. That's an ERC-20 token. Maybe I can buy it on the market. And so if there happens to be a coincidence of wants of somebody wanting to enter or exit at that time, 
But at the same time, a solver could just be specialized in these kinds of contract interactions. They would say, all right, this person, I wasn't able to find a match. I will just go directly to the contract and enter the pool for them. Um, but so there are a lot of different tokens out there that aren't necessarily in constant product pools. Um, I had two questions. They're a little, I guess, a little different between each other. But so, can in, can individual solvers see um, what all the other proposed solvers and their solutions were, or is this like a closed-off objective function where the entire competitive landscape doesn't see what other people proposed? So, I'm not sure if currently. I mean, if it's if we're not already doing it, I don't see why we wouldn't. But I, I suppose the the driver side of things. Basically, the, the dispatcher, the one that is dispatching these uh, instances out to all the solvers and receiving the responses back, I don't see any reason why, if it isn't already, just store these in some, somewhere for people to look at. I think right now, at the moment, the solvers themselves, I mean, you can add a Boolean flag to this that says uh, write instance files to disk, and, and then at least you can keep your own. And I think that's what the solvers are doing at the moment, keeping their own and keeping their own responses. Um, but I mean, if necessary, perhaps the, the driver could, could do something similar. Yeah, it just makes sense because, you know, if there's a competitive game going on, then technically, you know, you guys could pick people who didn't would beat the objective function and reward them, but you know that's so. In order to give us the credibility that we are cho we are indeed choosing the best solution, we might have to advertise that. Well, I mean, the best solution is being sent on chain. Oh yeah. So you can always compare the solution that you had with what was sent on chain. But, but just to add here, this is something we are working on actively uh, to add uh, a log, basically, of all the candidates that were submitted um, so that we can publish tenderly links of, you know, all the, all the candidates. And then you can also see maybe your solution, indeed, you computed a better objective value, but it got filtered out because it didn't simulate anymore on the tip of the, of the chain. Or, yeah, but basically having an insight into what is the competition going on. And right now we have it internally. So if you have a batch where you're really wondering, we can figure it out what happened there for you. But that doesn't scale, of course. We don't have the resources to do that. So we want to yeah, provide a, yeah, public access to, the, to all the candidates. Yeah, exactly. And then it allows you to, you know, as a solver, you can now compare and see how you can try and improve your solver relative to other people. Just not, you know, not even any honesty questions on, um, on cow side or not. Or, sorry, on the driver's side, um, but it just allows for you to maybe iterate on your um, on your solver and see how you can improve your objective function if you can compare against all the candidates. Um, and then my other question was: so if when everything is submitted to the driver and you know a solution is picked, what actually happens on the driver's side? And you know, so that people have been mentioning a lot of private liquidity. So what does the driver actually do if somebody were to like try and pull in funds from a source that um, that cow hadn't used as liquidity before? Like, you know, is there some kind of like building framework it does or they send in like a set of function calls and you guys like compile that on chain or what's the process going on there? So if you were here earlier and we looked at the, um, the schema for the response datum, you have the orders that with the executed amounts, the AMMs with their executed amounts, and then there's this additional thing, the interactions, where essentially a solver now can basically submit any contract call or contract execution um, on chain. So this is kind of the concept of private liquidity, if that's the case. Um, I myself am a little bit concerned about the use of private liquidity, so I don't know how that will play out long term. Um, I think that's all I can say about that at the moment. Um, yep, that is is a fun thing. Perfect. And just uh, which file was it in again? Just so I take a quick note to look at it later. The interaction. Oh, so <laughs> unfortunately, interactions have been left out of this, but I did put a reference. So at the very bottom of our readme, I just put a few references. So there is this tutorial written by perhaps somebody that's in this room. I'm not actually sure. Everybody's anonymous these days uh, on how to write a solver. Uh, I followed along with this quite a bit. Um, there's also a, a solver spec. Uh, the thing that you're referring to specifically is this interaction model. So actually something that I hadn't really mentioned yet is that um, there are a few things that aren't really 
properly documented just yet. Um, and that is, well, first of all, the interaction model has been left out of the schema that's here. Uh, so actually, in, in here, the file that you, you want to look at for the, the more or less like, good version of the schema is, is util schema. And this has all of the models that you see in the docs that when you're running the server and you go to the slash docs, you'll see this whole schema. And so interactions is actually left out of the settled batch auction model at the moment. However, and this is a great first issue for anybody who just wants to like contribute to this cute little framework. This is a link to the Rust code of the driver that accepts the interaction data. And so you can see the, the schema kind of, it's, it's a little scattered. Uh, you have the target, it's an address, the ETH value of the transaction, the call data, and this is the execution plan. Um, you also need to provide this along with the AMM interactions as well. It's essentially the ordering of which they're supposed to be executed. So, I mean, that's there as well. And, right, so, I mean, there is a link in the readme to this little bit of a thing that's missing right now. Um, there's a few other links to some, some scattered stuff. But, so there are, a, there are a few different things being sent to a solver at the time. Uh, we did see a few of them, uh, the, this, this metadata that's probably in this example tokens, well, AMMs. So it'll tell you sort of which network, auction ID, the gas price, the native token. So you have this being sent in with the instance JSON, but you also have all of these like query parameters that are being sent along in the URL. I didn't actually get a chance to show you this, but uh, I will show you now. So if I run this server um, with so for example, the instance name was something that I didn't provide. This comes along in the URL, so let's see. This post, you can actually do, oh, I need to do it from, and I will get to your question in just a moment, I promise, post. So this post, if I were to do like, so there's a few things, uh, um, this is all sort of specified in here, instance name equals my instance. So if I do this, oops, what did I do here? Not found. Um, oh, I gotta put a little question mark somewhere, like maybe here or here. Uh, sorry. Maybe, yeah, I think, I think there's a question mark. Right, so then you'll receive sort of this instance name. What we do, since this isn't super formalized or well documented right now, there's this stuff that's got the query parameters in the URL, some of them which are mandatory, or which are always there, and some of them which are optional, and some that are in the metadata. We sort of, sort of parse and read both of them. We treat them all as optional solver side, although some of them are coming in like always. This probably could be fixed up. And then we just merge them and we just treat them all uh, together. Uh, random fact. There was a question from the fellow in the yellow shirt right behind you. Um, thanks. It was a bit of a follow-up question from the first question of my colleague in front. Um, because you, we were discussing these uh, debates of whether your solution could be like left out or your rewards or the transparency of the order book and the driver. So do you get, so first question, do we get some response that our solution was like received in time and potentially is this signed because um, yeah do do we have some accounting on our side that l these solutions are there and then for the question of like transparency it's maybe valuable that it's signed because I could always like spend more time finding a solution and then afterwards come like hey guys I had a better solution but I spent two minutes on it uh, whatever right so so that was like for accounting yeah, totally. Right now, we don't have it, unfortunately, um, but it is a priority on the back-end team side to, um, to to publish the solutions we receive. And um, what you said totally makes sense that the we, in the proposal that is on, on the form right now, you actually do have different keys. Uh, so one would be the submission key, which is handled by the driver. One would be your rewards key. And so it, it does make sense to, to sign the solution you send to us just so that you know we cannot make it up and... 
to sign Right. So yeah, I mean Right. Yeah, so I mean we are, we're planning to just up basically what we do already in the driver side is we encode the solution into an actual transaction and then simulate it and basically that simulation link or that you know tenderly link or whatever with together with the objective value we just want to publish into like a, a public database so that people can see um, for this batch ID what were all the uh, solutions that were considered and and if there's a simulation link and it failed then you know okay well uh, my solution was invalid because something moved around um, yeah but, but it, right now it's not there yet, but you know, we're hoping to add this very soon because we know it. otherwise visibility into what's happening is going to be very cumbersome. Uh, I just, um, you said one inch is one of your biggest solvers right now. So I think, yeah, so at the moment, uh, and you can look at the stats for which solvers are winning the most rewards. The one inch solver is a single order solver and is currently winning because they have excellent proprietary routing uh, algorithms. Um, however, as time goes on and more orders are in a single batch, it is hopeful and likely that uh, other solvers who are uh, better at optimizing for solving batches rather than individual orders can overcome the, the the one inch as a single order solver. So sing single order solvers hopefully won't be like the, the thing of the future. I understand. Um, my question was more about the, the bigger picture sort of incentives. I guess one inch is involved now because it's sort of easy money or they could just do it now. But on the bigger picture, um, is there a structural sort of incentive for one of your aggregators to be solving? Because it's, it kind of goes against what they're, in a way they want their orders to go to them. But at the same time, there's, by solving, they're, they're being very objective. They're bringing the best solution. And if they win, they win. But I'm just curious, why would aggregators be involved in the solving mechanism when it's not really... So we actually built uh, like our, the one-inch solver ourselves. It basically just makes use of their public API to get the quotes and requests. And we just... I mean, one inch wasn't actually involved in developing the not. one inch solver, oh, okay. although they've heard wind of the fact that their solver is winning and they're quite keen to uh, start solving. So I think maybe they'll even up their game and start trying to work on um, using their thing to solve th their fancy routing software to uh, solve bigger batches. And, and maybe just why would uh, DEX aggregators or other protocols uh, like to participate uh, is because there's a significant volume that gets routed through their um, networks as well. And so, for example, PowerSwap is probably making a significant chunk of their total daily volume from trades that are routed via Cow protocol. And so, um, yeah, I think I mean, for AMMs as well, uh, Balancer is, is, is not primarily interested in people having in people using their front end. They're interested in people using their AMMs and getting as much volume as they can through AMMs. So really, um, that you know, uh, if we can get the users to use Car Protocol because that's just where you get the best prices, then people that are providing middleware or also uh, baseline liquidity uh, protocols would be, of course, very interested in, in just getting that that order flow and, and that volume against their. Uh, liquidity sources. Definitely. Cool. I guess we're settling down a bit. How many of you actually ran the solver and uh, are ready to start building their own now? All right. So would anybody like to describe their, their plans of approach or do they want to keep those things to themselves? Um, now, you, there was a lot of talk about private liquidity, and I mentioned um, I'm concerned about it. So I think right now, I mean, one way that I can see things going, although I'm not the decision maker in this thing, it's a DAO, really. Um, right now, there's this sort of, I guess, private liquidity, but it comes in the form of an order that is signed, and it's, so, it's part of the order book, and the solvers have access to it. Uh, as you can probably see from the parameters we're passing in, maybe in the example that we have, we have these, I don't know where anything is here, but, oh, I don't have it here, but there's a, another Boolean flag on the order, is liquidity order. 
Um, these are sort of like what I consider to be forms of private liquidity. Market makers? No? Not. Never mind. Forget everything that I said. No, no. It's, I mean, it, it, basically, you, we, we, uh, there's two ways. If you're a market maker, there's two ways of how you can um, interact, integrate with the protocol. One is you just post orders against the public API and let the solvers that are running kind of, you know, work on your liquidity that you provide. In that case, the protocol gives you a very advantageous fees. Basically, you can, I think it's, it's very close to zero fees. Um, but at the, at the same time, we will not um, take your orders into the uh, surplus, and your orders will not receive any surplus. So basically, if you're a sophisticated market maker, you can quote for very cheap, but you'll get matched at your quote, quoted price. Um, that is one way of how you can provide liquidity into the protocol. The other way would be um, through this uh, arbitrary interaction data where you basically um, yeah, reach out to your inventory contract or whatever contract that stores your funds and uh, execute trades on that, on that source. There again, because it's not part of the public order book, it will not contribute to surplus. So while you can use it to enhance the surplus of other orders, you know, giving yourself surplus on an order that you post is not going to count towards the objective value. So the only orders that actually count towards the objective value are the ones that are in the JSON that is handed down to you um, for fairness reasons that you know, all solvers have access to um, all potential sources of, of surplus. They're not liquidity orders. Uh, I just wanted to ask one, one final question. How would you um, formally define surplus? The formal definition, I can't give you the equation at the moment, but so you have your limit price. This is, uh, if you're a sell order, you have to do it for each, each one, of course. You have um, your sell amount and your buy amount, and you're saying, I'm willing to, I wanna sell all of, I wanna sell this for at least this much of that. Then, when you find the executed buy amount and the executed sell amount, the surplus is the difference, the executed buy amount minus the, the, the buy amount that you specified. That's your surplus. And this now is in the buy token. And you, when we evaluate it, we would, attempt, we would convert this into one reference token for everything. So on a buy order, you're saying, I want exactly 10 of these, and I don't wanna pay any more than this much, the sell amount. And so, for surplus, it goes the opposite direction. You're, you're, if you're getting surplus, then you're selling less. You're paying less for getting exactly this. And the executed sell amount, it's the absolute value of this difference. Um, that's your surplus. That's in the sell token, needs to be converted to the reference token. I think that's a fairly formal definition without getting too many pluses and minuses. Um, Maybe just for the, because somebody was asking this earlier as well, for the price that we use, you, you alluded to it earlier, it is the price that we pass in the instance JSON before the auction. So you might compute new prices, and those prices might be, you know, what's the new status quo, but for converting the surplus into ETH, we use the prices that were provided in the instance of JSON, the pre-auction prices, as basically, the as the reference, yeah, so that it's even playing field for all solvers, even if they come up with different, um, you know, resulting prices. Excellent point. And for those of you who are like excited about um, operations research, mathematical optimization, who aren't yet aware of the differences between the sell orders and the buy orders, I mean, they are quite a, quite a funnily different geometric thing. Um, on the sell order side, you're saying, um, I have this much, I wanna get rid of this much, and I want at least this much of something else. And so, you're sort of unbounded. You could, you could have arbitrarily high, you have this lower bound of how much at least, but it's unbounded to infinity for how much you can actually give. But on the buy order side, it's the other way. You're saying, I want exactly 10, and I'm not willing to pay more than this. And so the sort of, the bounds are finite from zero to your maximum sell amount. So geometrically, buy orders and sell orders are like quite different things. Just a fun fact, if you are gonna go out there and really write a, a linear model for these. But there's actually good research on it already, and you can probably start from there. If anybody's interested in a link, I can share that. But a buy swap, a buy swap is a sell swap in reverse, isn't it? Isn't it? A buy is actually just a sell in reverse. It's just a swap at the end of the day. When you're interacting with this, you're just, you're just 
swapping. Uh, so your buy could be a sell and your sell could be a buy. Sure, thing. it does wind up being um, sort of similar at the end of the day in some sense, but I mean, they are quite different. Like if, see what this, this protocol enables you to do is you can get a haircut with, with some random coin that I've never heard of and the barber only accepts USDC and they want $15 for this haircut. And so you're not gonna place a sell order to buy 15 USDC, you're gonna place a buy order. And of course our interface has this wonderful thing where you can specify the recipient. And so you can literally send 15 USDC to your barber exactly by placing a buy order on our exchange with, exchange with whatever random token you have that you wanna get your haircut with. Because you're not gonna get a, a haircut on two quarters or a haircut on a quarter. Right. You could even specify a tip. Um, it's maybe a little it's too specific, so tell me if it is. But uh, I've been browsing the driver code a bit, and I've noticed that recently you've added a limitation that uh, um, settled orders have to be within like 3% of some price that, uh, that you give. Can you explain? Um, why, theoretically, to like order, some, like if someone can get a better price, why limit it by this 3%? I'm not overly familiar with that recent development or the reason for doing so. Perhaps Alex here is more familiar with that? The, the commit blames to Alex, so I'll give it. <laughs> yes, it's, it's very, it has a very practical reason and simply that we want to filter out all invalid solutions. And there are many more checks than just, for example, the price check. This is just one. And yeah, but there are others, for example, we, the next one that will be committed is that there will not be any surplus shifts in solutions. So that if a person trades against the AMM and kind of earns surplus from the AMM, because the AMM gives, gives him the good price, then this surplus can no longer be stolen to another um, so um, order uh, so that he really gets in the fair price. And right now, kind of the internal solvers that we have, they kind of um, already go with all these rules. But now, if we are opening it up, we have to implement more and more of these um, rules. And exactly, that's that what you are then seeing in the driver current. It's really filtering out invalid solutions that usually don't make sense. Like, I think maybe one or the other time a solution snipped through and then it was only settleable because the internal buffers made it in the end settleable. But yeah, normally it should even just fail in normal um, simulations on chain. But sometimes we, the internal buffers make it work anyways and then we need other checks and yeah, that's, that's one of the checks. So I read somewhere in the docs that um, you need to distribute surplus in a fair way to the users. Um, is that only, uh, if I match two orders, I get it, I have to be in the middle and not uh, provide the surplus to, to one of them in an unfair matter. But if I have several orders that I match, and so do I need to kind of redistribute surplus fairly among all of them, even if they aren't related or matched as a whole big circle? Right, so I know surplus distribution has been quite a challenging problem for our solver team over the last little while. And this, and also I'm not overly familiar with the development of that research, I think this may also be a good question for Alex. And uh, just by the way, we're, we're running a little short on time, but we can always continue this conversation. I just want to get this stupid thing off my head soon. Yes, so we will, the team here will definitely be hanging around. Just come talk to us, and I think we can help you like with everything. Even if you're just with your private solver running into some issues, we will definitely also take curiously a look into that and then try to help you. But yeah, regarding the surplus shifting, um, it is definitely a little bit more tricky topic, but I think we in, in the team have found um, reasonable solutions for that. And one 
Like there are basically two kind of things. The first one is if that somebody steals surplus from an that clearly belongs to another order because he kind of got it from the AMM. So if I and for these ones we kind of have formulas that later on check that or it's basically just an algorithm that basically checks if there was clearly this one order that was traded against these and these AMMs and kind of got the surplus from these AMMs, then we can see that very clearly and then the solutions must sati satisfy this, we call it the cycle condition, that then really um, yeah, the surplus sticks with this order. That the prices that, this, um, that must be given from the solvers should be congruent with some AMM prices that we also see at this block um, on chain at least also within some smaller regular room. And then we think we have also combated these small issues. And yeah, hopefully it will be settled like that.